I'm sure I'm far from alone in saying that Disney animation had a significant impact on my childhood. The many classic films that the studios released always have a certain quality that sets them apart, and they were a key factor in my pursuing a career in animation. I've collected many books on Disney animation over the years, covering the history of the company, the pre-production artwork, and the making of the films. But if there's one that truly gives an insight into what makes these films unique, it would have to be The Illusion of Life by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston. It's now exactly 100 years since Walt and Roy Disney founded the studio, on October the 16th, 1923. And The Illusion of Life is the perfect place to look if you want to understand what it is that makes Disney animation special, and what it is that's helped it to remain at the forefront of entertainment over the past 100 years. The Illusion of Life is a massively comprehensive volume, not the usual superficial overview that we commonly expect to find. This book really does dive into the nuts and bolts of how these films are made. The authors, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, were two of Disney's famous nine old men, a group of animators responsible for creating many of the classic Disney characters we all know and love. Each with around 43 years at the studio, it's hard to imagine anyone better qualified to describe that elusive illusion of life that Disney animation is known for. The book starts out by exploring the early days of the studio. The first decade was when much of the groundwork was laid that would enable the feature films to become a possibility. Despite the often repeated quote, it all started with a mouse, it actually started with a girl called Alice. Walt had created a film called Alice's Wonderland at his previous laugh o studio, combining a live-action girl with simple cartoon characters. Unfortunately, he was forced to close the studio before he could sell the film. After moving to Hollywood, Walt was able to get a contract to make more Alice films, and together with his brother Roy, he formed what was then known as the Disney Brothers Studio. The Alice films were followed by an Oswald the Lucky Rabbit series, and it wasn't until 1928, after Disney lost the rights to the Oswald character, that Mickey Mouse was finally brought to life. Throughout those early years, and indeed those that followed, Walt was always pushing for higher quality, and all of his money went into the films and the studio. The desire to make a superior quality of animation helped to attract the best artists, and the constant drive for improvement led to an open atmosphere at the studio, one where all of the animators shared their knowledge and helped to push each other forward. This may seem an obvious thing, but it wasn't typical in studios of the day. Frank and Ollie said, an animator could take his drawings to any of the other men, and they would happily make suggestions, showing what had worked for them in a similar situation, or excitedly considering something completely new. Amongst the many successful short films, there were also numerous misses, but each was an opportunity to try something new and improve. Walt also wanted to move beyond the simple gag-driven shorts of the time, and start to tell complete stories with believable characters. What seemed like a gamble at the time, the creation of stories with heart and warmth, rather than relying upon comedy alone, would go on to become key to the success of the studio. The second decade of the studio is often referred to as the Golden Age. Work started on Snow White in 1934. This led to even greater investment in learning, and the creation of an in-house art school to help prepare for the challenges ahead. Live action footage was analysed for insights to create more believable motion, animals were brought into the studio to study, and life drawing was practised regularly. The creation of the strongest story was always crucial, and as Frank and Ollie state, it was never too late to make a change. Nothing was ever set as long as the possibility existed that it could be made to relate better to the overall picture or communicate more strongly with the audience. The studio grew rapidly and was boosted further by the phenomenal success of Snow White's release in 1937. Pinocchio, Fantasia, Dumbo and Bambi were all released during this period of massive growth and creativity. But with war raging in Europe, most of the films lost money at the box office, despite going on to become enduring classics. The book highlights many of the key characters who played a part in both this golden age and the many years that followed. Their individual contributions were often significant, but it was in assembling a talented and dedicated team who were able to collaborate that the best results were achieved. Whilst the book covers a lot of history, with important insights peppered throughout. It also goes into specifics about many of the lessons learnt during those early years. The chapter on the principles of animation clearly covers the 12 fundamental principles which have become the basis of all quality animation at Disney and beyond, and this is essential to study for all new animators. There are also chapters on animating expressions and dialogue and acting and emotions which offer valuable insights. But in the preface to the book, Frank and Ollie have some words of caution. Many will look to this book to teach them the secrets of Disney animation, 
so that they can become instant successes. Unfortunately, this craft cannot be learned by just reading a book, and not overnight under any circumstances. The Illusion of Life is a vast book, which you can return to time and again. Each time you revisit it, it's inevitable that you'll take away some new insight as your knowledge increases, and you can now more fully understand something which you missed before. Whilst the book may not guarantee instant success, it's packed with decades of accumulated knowledge from the absolute giants of the animation industry, and it cannot help but improve the work of anyone who heeds its lessons. Frank and Ollie later go on to say, with electronic aids being perfected and new tools and materials being used, who can possibly foresee what lies ahead? It probably will not be another Walt Disney who will lead the way, but someone or some group of artists will surely discover new dimensions to delight and entertain the world. Hopefully, this book will be their springboard. In the 42 years that have passed since the release of The Illusion of Life, we've undoubtedly seen those new tools being put to use and new dimensions being explored, both within and outside the Disney Studios. And it's safe to say that The Illusion of Life has been an instrumental part of that. The foundations that were formed back in the 1930s and refined over the decades that followed helped to take animation from a novelty to an art form, which captivates audiences to this day. So, 100 years on, what is it that makes Disney animation special and keeps it at the forefront of entertainment? There are obvious takeaways from the book, such as the dedication to quality, the constant drive to improve and the open sharing of knowledge, all of which is in service of crafting the best possible story and characters with rich, believable personalities. But in truth, there are so many elements that go into the mix. It's impossible to sum it up any better than Frank and Ollie did. What is it that makes Disney animation special? The illusion of life. And, if you really want to start to understand the secrets, you just need 